Hello and welcome to this week's Football Annual Podcast. This week it's a crunch edition of the pod. Seeing as we have the appointment of Dickard Verkat to talk about as Dutch national team manager, final to collapse at Excelsior, the final day of the Eredivisie, who wins the title, plus Europa League action for Ajax and the future of Davy Klaassen, Ajax captain. We hope you enjoy. We're on SoundCloud, YouTube and iTunes as usual to answer your questions on Twitter, as well as to be able to listen and download us. Let's start with the appointment of Dick Avercut as the Dutch national team manager. What do you three think? Yeah, I've just been looking at Hans van Brokkelen's quotes. He said that he contacted the players, um, some of the players, you know, articulated that they felt um, a certain way when he left the last year, but he said uh, the possibilities of that happening again is very, is very low. Um, and also, he said the players re- um, responded in a very professional way and uh, will be willing to work with him going forward. And it's an appointment that, you know, shows because he's old on the Twitter page for Football Rania, he's we sort of had that he's the oldest manager and um, it's I think I like the aspect of um, of Hullet sort of assisting him because it, it's it's as that same structure that Van Hal and um, Clivert had where uh, Clivert would sort of engage some of the younger players and he was sort of an idol for some of those younger players and he sort of earned the respect of them and he could and he sort of added that human touch to what Van Hal was doing. And I think Hullet is, he's always more than self as so, so somewhat of someone that understands tactics and things like that. So he will sort of, uh, you know, get to with these young players, you know, the villainers, the, uh, the, the Pies and the Janssens, the, and the many young defenders that we have. And he will sort of work with them while, you know, um, while Avaka will be the coach. But I think we, we won't know how 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 good an appointment this is since until the first round of games come. come. But as I've said on previous parts, he was very... Um, the Netherlands' best run of form under him was... Under Blind was when he was assisting Blind and... That that's very that's uh, that's a, a sort of inspiring point for me, and I think if he can sort of you know you know put aside some of his differences with some of the the other the players who felt bad that he left in, in the way he left last year, I think maybe this could be an, a good appointment for the right now, but not for the future. Yeah, I think um, the fact that it's only a short term deal is. The clever aspect of it, because if I forget to sign like a two-year deal, I would be happy. But the fact that it's only till November, and then possibly if we do make the World Cup, then it goes on longer. But um, as Shaka said, top ten form under Blind came when Advocat was there. Um, you know, it's not an appointment for the future; it's an appointment for right now. And if you can get results, and if you can inspire something out of the squad. The run of games coming up, then it's a good appointment. He's experienced, he's done it before, he's done it twice before. Um, I know I didn't work with Hiddink, but um, I think what Netherlands don't need right now is somebody that's never coached you know, a big side, a big um, national team. So if it was who on his own, you know, it'd probably be a disaster. But the fact that Africa has a bit of experience to him can hopefully get some um, confidence going on the side to head in his games and then hopefully take us to the World Cup. Um, if that happens, then yeah, it's a good appointment for the short term. Then after the World Cup, we'll get somebody else for the future. I watched the um, the press conference of Hans van Brokelen uh, yesterday, and it was like something out of a Monty Python sketch. Uh, someone who appears to be out of their depth, trying to uh, pander to the media by uh, trying to get trying to make them understand his point of view and why he did certain things. Um, it appears that. When he was giving information such as um, speaking with Tenkata and um, and going from one to the other and perhaps playing one off the other, 
It appeared that Van Brokelen was obsessed with the uh, the couple of manager and assistant, whereas normally you get the man you want and you let him decide who his assistant will be. Um, I think for the short term, it's the best possible appointment they could have hoped for. One thing I find staggering with the news from yesterday is that Hoop Stevens appears to be have been appears to have been completely overlooked. Um, this is a man that won eight major trophies in his career, as well as the UEFA Cup with Schalke, and he has an absolutely wonderful reputation in Germany. I know he had some some health issues, but if he was um, if he was doing a national team job, which isn't extremely intense, I think he would have been able to manage. And um, uh, there also there's also news today that uh, Ron Jans will not be coming, uh, not be be becoming the um, the teacher at the, uh, the Dutch FA due to um, the person he was going to work with was going to be manager of Go Ahead Eagles. So it appears that um, uh, that they could have waited perhaps a little bit longer and have maybe maybe two more options. But um, I think it's the best one for the short term. But uh, they have to look ahead at some point to the long term. They can't keep putting that off. And um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I've stated on many occasions I don't believe that they will qualify for the World Cup, uh, primarily due to the group they're in. And um, I suppose you just have to let him finish the uh, qualifying campaign and uh, and see where they go from there, really. I myself am not too happy with the appointment of Avocat. I think I think he's too old. And I stated last week that I think he has got past his best. He's had a great career as a manager. And it's it's good, though, that, yeah, Kullet is with him to help guide him and add, as Jack said, that human touch, a bit of youth to the to the setup. Um, but let's see how they do. And ultimately, my opinion is I don't think it can be any worse than Blint. Um, but, yeah, I just, to go back on James's point, um, I know Michael wants to say something percent Sorry about it, Michael. Um, but there, there was a question from, from Mark, uh, so from, from this from Iqbal, and he says, have the K and the B lost the plot with Avocat's appointment? Do they have no fresh ideas? I think this, the way that it, it was sort of run, because, you know, you read on Football International, who were quite close to the Tenkata uh, K and B, B story, where apparently Tenkata is saying that he was sort of given the job, and some, and then uh, Van Brocklin said that he, he wouldn't, he would deny it in the media, instead of being more honest and, you know, and it ended up with Tenkata sort of, you know, taking a call from Van Brokelen with a journalist uh, with him, um, Martin Camberdam from the uh, Vopo International. And that, that, that started sort of an unnecessary um, difficulty to the situation. And it, it could have certainly be ha- been handled better. And uh, Van Brokelen said that he, he, he still retains the respect from people within the KNVB. So, uh, and even with what James said, the sort of obsession with having a manager and an assistant manager together is sort of another thing that, another thing that really disrupted the Ten Carter talks because they were talking about pairing him with Fred Ritten. So it was, that the way that was handled, it, it, it looked bad in the KNVB and sort of, having a list and not being able to attract anybody from the list and, you know, allowing Avocat to believe that he was, you know, top of the list when, in fact, he wasn't, is also another problem. And uh, just the situation where Hullet and and Avocat are two people that have, you know, tried to be hired by the KMVB to work with the Dutch national team and have left and have now come back it's also it also adds a bad taste to the to the whole situation, which you know could have which in all in all could have been handled better. So Van Brocklin's made a hire, which isn't his top hire, but and, but has to pray that it works because if it doesn't work, then he's in big trouble. So uh, I think they they need to improve on how they sort of handle these situations, and I think. For now, it looks like there will, there will be an advocate could bring a period of calm and things like that. But uh, the way the KMVB has handled things in the past few years it hasn't been um, hasn't been great. Yeah, 
I think Van Brooklyn comes out as looking an absolute shambles. Um, he's not handled it well at all, and it's everything just seemed to leak out in the media. And you know, he's him saying that he's going to deny that he's offered a job to Tenka when a journalist was right there when he did it. You know, he just makes himself look stupid. And it, as James said earlier on, he's out of his debt. And he said earlier on that you know William Van Hal must come into the KMBB, even if it means putting him up a job. And I think that is to wait for the future because. Say this doesn't go well, never to make the World Cup. Would anybody trust Van Brooklyn to find the next manager that's going to do it? I wouldn't. Um, I mean, even a shortlist for this one, like there are names that all turned it down. Then you know, the guy asked about four managers, like, oh, you should. You'd love to see the list of the four managers that approached me about it. You know, like as if he's trying to say that all these different, like huge foreign managers were interested in the position. Well, all events up with. Dick Advocate. So, I mean, if there was that much interest, surely they could have came up with somebody a bit better. Um, what I was going to say was, uh, on his um, route to it before, when he was getting offered the assistant position, he said he wouldn't do it. Um, he wanted a, uh, something put in his contract about possibly being considered to be the next coach if Blind, you know, left. And I really hope that that's not happened. I hope Van Brook has not put something in his deal that's I say as well, Dick Advocat will be in charge until the World Cup and then Ruth Hill will take over because, you know, clearly that didn't work with Danny Wind. It's just one of these situations when the KMBB is handcuffing himself. I think what this has also has shown is Van Brokelen's lack of experience for the position he finds himself in. I mentioned on a, a previous pod about the Hank Kessler, who was also um, uh, director at the Dutch FA and was heavily involved in... Um, in selecting the uh, for new da- national team managers, and there was always transparency from beginning to end in terms of the candidate they wanted, getting who they wanted, no messing about, no uh, no um, insecurities regardless of what they're actually doing. And I, I just get the impression that Van Brokelen finds himself in a position that he doesn't want to relinquish, and he will do anything to cling on to it. But if you also, when you're in certain organisations, in any job, you have to be uh, competent in what you do. And I think that he's, uh, maybe he's enjoying the gravy train too much, but you've also got to be competent in what you do. And I, I think the way he's gone about his business from, be, from beginning to end shows a lack of experience, a lack of transparency. And um, now it's coming across that they're hoping for the best in the short term, but they can't put off for long-term needs of the national team because, um, for example, if they do qualify and they have a, and they have a, they have a good World Cup, it doesn't mean all the problems are solved. But, um, yeah, I just I find it quite strange, really. And um, just uh, you, you can only hope that they make the best of it with a, with a um, finishing strong in a qualifying campaign and then uh, looking forward to the future. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about results. And in a couple of weeks... There's a couple of friendlies, Morocco, Ivory Coast, and then in June it's against Luxembourg at home. Um, you know, Fred Graham's probably going to be in charge of those games. And then if the win knows, you know, everything starts to look a bit better, and then this is how it goes from there. If no one's made the World Cup, then nobody really talks about Van Broek, and um, it's only when it really goes wrong that his name's going to come up again. On the positive side, Avocat has a lot of experience, and... He's managed the Netherlands in the past. Um, what, what's his style? What's Avocat's style of play? What, what formations does he play? And is, he, is he flexible as a manager? And I just wondered if any of you guys wants to share how he's done in the past. And is there a positive side to his appointment? This is his third. This will be his third spell as national team uh, manager. And if you look at the gaps in between, the first one was the World Cup. Uh, Qualification for the United States in 1994. To give you how, to give you an impression as to, ha- as to how long ago that was, the current the England manager back then was Graham Taylor, and um, he managed to get the uh, the Netherlands to a World Cup, and they reached the quarterfinals and was eliminated by Brazil. Uh, if you fast forward ten years to when he took the took the job again, uh, they reached the uh, the semi finals of Euro 2004, losing to. Um, Losing to the Czech Republic, I believe, and, um, and, then, and then if you fast forward uh, to, to the Czech Republic, it was um, sorry, I have to double check that. But anyway, he was in charge of uh, Euro 2004. They lost in the group phase to the Czech Republic, and then 
there's now a gap of 13 years. And um, so there's a long time in between stints. And um, he may well have done well in the past with better footballers and better men. But now you're, now you're dealing with younger players who are not so uh, well, um, not completely uh, rounded as footballers or individuals. And it'd be interesting to see uh, how he deals with that. I think um, a very interesting fact about his first spell in charge was actually that he fell out with Rutulet. Um Rutulet wasn't happy with the tactics that Hadfakat was using. Um, that actually led to Hewitt retiring from international football um, because he fell out. And interestingly enough, Hadfakat was set to lose his job to Johan Cruyff, but then that talks with the KMDB broke down and Hadfakat stayed on and who had never returned to the national team. So it's strange to think that, you know, the two of them had that sort of relationship now. They're going to come together at a national team 20 years on, 23 years on, and try and lead them to a World Cup. It's going to be interesting if any of those well, relationships from back then, any of those disagreements and tactics actually come back, and will they two actually be able to work together? Yeah, I think I can speak from his most recent jobs, I think, uh, with... So if Sunderland, he came and he kept them up. He went to Arsenal and he got a, a very good nil-nil draw. And uh, someone the more interesting, someone that he's worked closely with over the last few years is uh, Heromain Lenz, who will be one of the uh, sort of older players that he, that could be pivotal in the next few months. And I think having a relationship with a player like that that hasn't been that wasn't sort of introduced in, during the Blind or Hidnik era, and um, it, it could be pivotal and things like that. And also just having worked with this squad before, like as recently as last year, having an innate knowledge of how how certain players work and where to put players, and that's the most important thing because. You don't want a situation where, you know, Strudman's playing uh, defensive midfield alone and you're yeah, sort of shoehorning Wijnaldum, who, who's one of the better players in the squad playing in, the, in a higher level, uh, into, into a role that he's not particularly comfortable with. And Blind looked like he had egg on his face when he had to come out of the Dutch media and I had to apologise to Wijnaldum for playing out of position. So I, th I think uh, just on, on what he's done recently, I think he's good enough to sort of be a stopgap and to sort of uh, know the strengths and weaknesses of this, of this team and how to remedy them. So I think that, that he would be a good appointment in that aspect for the now. Yeah. Um, Come on, James. Uh, just to follow up on what I said earlier, when I uh, needed to correct myself as regards to 2004, uh, Advocat reached the semi-finals upon which they lost to Portugal. It was in the group phase where they uh, they were leading against um, Czech Republic and um, Advocat took off for Robin and replaced him with Paul Bosveld and they went on to lose the game, upon which he received an awful lot of uh, criticism. So I just wanted to put that right for the listeners, because uh, my, um, my memory blanked me for a minute or two, so I, had to, I just wanted to put that right. Yeah, well, that, that shows that. I mean, he's had ups and downs in his career um, as a manager. He's got to the semi-finals of a major competition uh, with the Netherlands. But it's, it's not because he's done bad in his career, but little things like that, that, that bad substitution. And I, as a site RZ fan, I, I watched them in 2013-14 season when Advocat was in charge and they had a good run in Europe. Um, and he was he was pivotal to that, really. He, he really, like, led the team and was the do best in the league, he knew how to get those results in Europe and it got him through and that works in international football, does it not? Um, and I just wanted to comment this question on Twitter again uh, from Mark and he asks, with our Avocat being the oldest national team coach ever, who do the panel believe is the next up and coming young Dutch manager to keep an eye on? Now we've answered this question sort of in the past with a few names, but are any of these names realistic? And Will this appointment, as Chuck said, be a stopgap appointment for a young manager? And who, who do you think that could be? If you're looking at someone that's really close to the national team job and not young, you look at Ron Jans, who's not young, but younger than Advocate. 
But if you're looking at young managers around the Eredivisie, uh, you sort of look at um, you know your the, the the managers at the upper echelon, the sort of you know Kaku's, the the um, Van Bronckhorst, Faber's, Fabers. You know, if you're looking lower down, um, in two years with Heracles, uh, Jon Stegman has done a fantastic job. I thought if he got, got Heracles into the top 10 this season, uh, he would have done a phenomenal job. And PSV have just hired Dennis Ha um, as the young PSV coach. He was highly rated at, at AZ, where they hired him from. And they said they thought that he would be the next manager, but he's moved to PSV. And you're also looking at Eric Ten Hag, who, who could have a chance to sort of uh, wet his beak in the in Europe next season, if he and that's determined if he can keep this squad together. So there's a lot of young, talented managers, but the problem is we don't have managers who are talented enough to sort of be getting looked at. Post uh, advocate because the um, they're not ripe yet. They're not. Uh, you have a few journeymen, but they aren't as well travelled as sort of your headings, your Van Hals, your advocates will when um, when they sort of start to take over the national team. So that that that's the major problem. But in ter- in terms of uh, young managers, just in general coming up. There's quite a few, even sort of Arnie Slot at um, AZ, who's going to be the assistant coach of AZ this season, only 38 years old, and uh, turned uh, Campbell's season around. So uh, I think, yeah, those are my picks. I, I would elaborate on the Ernest Farber and Ellington Hark. I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of Ernest Farber. I think as soon as. Um, I think as soon as Koku moves on from PSV, they won't have to look too far for a replacement. And, uh, of course, Erik Ten Hag, with his experience with the second team of Bayern Munich and his experience with the go-ahead Eagles as well in the past, I think those two are the two standouts to make strides um, um, domestically in the future. But whether either of them would go on to uh, international clubs remains to be seen. But they would uh, definitely be my two picks to keep an eye on for the future. Yeah, for me, Ten Hag's, Ten Hag's a standout young manager in there busy right now, I think. He's done a great job at Utrecht, but you know, if you're looking at in a year's time, if Advocat leaves after the World Cup, hopefully make it. Um, you know, you're looking at what call could be available after an hour year at PSV, and the main man that everybody wants is Ronald Koeman. In a year's time, an hour year at Everton, he said he wasn't ready for it yet. But in a year's time, I could change. Uh, Kimmin to be the man to take over after the next World Cup. You know, a fresh slate, him coming in, um, you know, that would be the best for the national team. But one interesting coach that's going to be it um, for next season is Mark Van Bommel. He's taking charge of the PSV under-19s, I think. Um, and he might be getting grim to take over from, from Kalku. So I'm interested to see how he does in the youth teams next season. Yeah, and it was also more important that they kept him from Bayern Munich, who wanted him to sort of follow Ten Hag and be the uh, Bayern uh, second team coach. And he stayed to sort of coach the PSV under-19s. Uh, and, you know, there's also Ten, ha- Ten Hag's assistant, uh, De Jong, who PSV were looking at for the young, young PSV role. And um, you also sort of look at, you know, uh, Marcel Kaiser, who, Done well with young young Ajax and got them into the top four and top I think top two quite comfortably this season with a very young young Ajax team and uh, I think in terms of you know managers coming through domestically there should be no problem and if you're talking about national team bosses I think in a year two years time someone might be looking at. Peter Boz after all that he's done this season. And, yeah. I think one interesting um, aspect is Vim Young. Um, you know, he got so much praise for what he did with the youth teams I act before he left. It's strange that he's not really gotten his job since then. And you know, he's one that could be an assistant at a national team level and maybe work his way up 
I mean, if they named Yonk as an assistant to to advocate with Bullet, that's not it. It's worked with a lot of young players, working with the players that are coming through now. And uh, he's one a coach to look forward to in the future as well. You spoke about Peter Bosch, um, attacker. How, how good a job has he done? And switching topics slightly, um, the Europa League matches Thursday away at Lyon. Um, do you think he has the, the tactical nose to try and tweak the tactics that didn't quite go so well away at Schalke? Because last time in the quarterfinals, Ajax had a lead going into the second leg, but threw it away throughout the match. Um, can they avoid that this time? Can Bosch prove that how, how good a manager is by doing that and seeing the tie out? Yeah, I think it was mainly the thing that they didn't do against Schalke in that way like was they didn't pressure them. They um and you know in in this week, uh, just a few days ago, Boss uh talked about his sort of philosophy at the KMVB um uh the KMVB meeting where a lot of coaches came through and he talked about the importance of pressing, especially when playing a high line as he does and the five second rule and things like that. And the fact that Ajax didn't play with that sort of intensity, they didn't, uh, they didn't really, um, they didn't really like, they didn't really pressure for the ball, and they they kind of sat off, and they weren't uh, defensively uh, sound. It really didn't help them against Schalke, and that's what they need to do against uh, Lyon. But I think. The Verhaver and uh, Veltman are so important, and having them back is so important. But the thing, the other thing is that everybody's rested this week because they played that young team against uh, against Go Ahead Eagles, where you just saw a lot of young talents. Not all the goal scorers in a four no in under 20, 20 years and under. It was a brilliant game to watch, and I think if Ajax stayed true to themselves and they sort of also, you know, he said, he just recently said in his press conference that's going on now, it's, I'm looking to score and not concede. So that's the important, most important thing, to not concede, not concede early, not concede er- at the end of the first half, not concede at the beginning of the second half, and just, uh, just manage the momentum, just manage the game. And that's the biggest thing for a young team, just to manage the game, just to see it. The, um, the the points where Leon dominate through and just you know if they get a counter just uh, be uh, just be able to finish it and we, we, against Leon in the first leg we saw them again not not finish chances and they need that's something they need to get better and at if they are, if they are to make it into the final and if they are to do something they fine just get better at finishing chances because I think in Europe there's no better team in the Europa League right now, that's better at creating chances. It's just a matter of finishing them. And um, I think I have very high hopes for them tomorrow because he also spoke in The Guardian today about, you know, sort of coaching his players to deal with Lacazette, look at uh, situations where he, he thought, you know, if Lacazette's there, he's going to score. So just, just sort of uh, coaching those players to in the situation of football where which hindered AZ in, when they were absolutely battered by, by you know, just and I think yeah in, in the second legs like this away again away games like this it's all about the situations all about managing the situations and defending well and attacking well in certain situations and I have a lot of faith in Ajax that can that they can do that and I don't expect them to combust against uh, Leon and I think Leon's defense is isn't as rigid as other teams in Europe, so there are away goals to be scored. Then I think once if Ajax score a goal, I think Leon's heads drop because they're also a young team. I think that Leon will win the tie, but I can also see Ajax scoring. My prediction for the match is three-one. I think uh, this European campaign has shown how far Peter Bosch has come as a manager. It was only 12 years ago that he led Heracles to the first division title. Uh, his experience as well uh, at Vitesse and um, at um, Maccabi Tel Aviv as well. He's, um, he's enjoying uh, the fruits of his labours and uh, 
rightfully gaining gaining attention. And I think should Ajax go and reach the final, I think it would be fantastic for Dutch football. The attention which has been lavished on Ajax so far, I think that will be magnified should they reach the final. And um, I think it's something to be uh, to be taken in, something to be enjoyed. And I certainly think that they have a chance in the final should they reach Stockholm. They are not. They wouldn't be going to Stockholm to most probably probably play Manchester United to be completely. Um, play off the park. I have full confidence that should Ajax reach the final in Stockholm, that they would um, they would take the game to Manchester United, and I can also see him winning. And um, I think uh, I just think the tie tomorrow. I can see Leon uh, going for it, going for it from the offset, attacking, 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 and that's why I think that at some point Ajax will score, but uh, Leon will go on to win the tie. Yeah, we're watching we had a game at the weekend, um, they played against Nantes in the, the league. We started the strongest team and they struggled uh, really badly. They conceded twice, they just came back and won 3-2. Um, Memphis Depay got two assists. Their defence was all over the place again and Nantes could have scored more goals. And I think that's where you have confidence in the side to at least score one more goal. Um, or a free goal lead in the... Uh, it's huge, and if I was going to get at least one away goal, then I should really kill it. So it just really depends on how Boss sets his side up. Um, I think Kenny Tete and uh, Riedewald did so well in the first leg, it's going to be a shame for him to drop out. But the experience of Beltman and Beerhaver at the defence is going to be huge. Um, and then you're looking at Eunice and you're looking at Traore, they're the, they're the pace in the side, and if they get chances, they need to take it. Uh, Going into tomorrow, but I'm very confident that I agree with James. I think Leon might win, but I can definitely see IS scoring and reaching the final. And I totally agree with James. Like Manchester United is not Manchester United of old. If this IS team gets to the final and it's Manchester United that they're facing, then and they've got confidence that they can win it because Manchester United aren't doing well in the league. They're missing key players for injury. This is definitely a chance for IS who are so dynamic and going forward and there was so much about his team that I shouldn't really fear anybody that's in the Europa League and heading into the Champions League hopefully they can have a good campaign next season as well Yeah I think Bosch has really got to manage the game very very well he has to try and break it up into segments and really try and get solidify the team um, it's not Alex's way but they need to see it out um, and just see it as another game and not as a tie if they see it as a tie and they go one down Take thoughts to start to come into heads, thinking, "Oh, this, you know, this could be Schalke all over again." But yeah, they, they, I think they'll be fine, and it will be a tighter match than perhaps some predict. Um, perhaps something like two one, but yeah, I think they've definitely got a chance of getting the goal. And you know, should they make it to the final, if the will the players be exhausted for Sunday? We all know what's happening Sunday. It's the last day of the Eredivisie, and I still have a chance of winning the title. As it stands, final just need to win against Heracles. But should they draw or lose, Ajax can take full advantage with a win away at Villem Tway. Um, what did you make of final last weekend? I personally wasn't surprised because I backed itself you to down at 10 to 1. And <laughs> uh, I, was, I was quite pleased with that. Um, I knew that the pressure would get to final. And the pressure has gotten to them, gotten to them. I think all media outlets, supporters themselves getting tattoos of uh, title commemorations when no trophy has been lifted. I think the whole country in general, apart from outside of Amsterdam, may have been guilty of, of kind of accepting it's already been done and dusted. But with the connotations of, uh, of Sunday, that's not the case. Um, I personally have no idea what is going to happen on Sunday. I couldn't tell you whether um, whether Feyenoord will go on to win, whether Heerdekles will snatch a point they need to get into contention um, uh, they need to get into contention for the Europa League playoffs. So Heerdekles have something to play for. It wouldn't surprise me if Ajax take a very, very quick lead in Tilburg. That wouldn't surprise me at all. And then it's about how do they deal with that in the Cup. 
if it comes for, if it comes through on the on the wireless that I actually two nil up for example and after twenty minutes um, it's still nil nil. Um, I think it's going to be like in two thousand and seven when there was three teams that could go for the title. That whole ninety minutes was uh, like a pinball. One minute, it, one minute it was RZ, one minute it was PSV, the next minute it was Ajax. It was chopping and changing right at the end. And afterwards, PSV won that title on goal difference by one goal only. I can see Sunday being an afternoon of um, of uh, one minute is final, one minute is Ajax, one minute is final, one minute is Ajax, right until the very end. And then I think um, I think this title will be settled either way with in the last minute minute of the season. Uh, whether that's in finals, um, uh, in favour or in Ajax's favour, I, I I don't know. But what I do know is that it will be uh, it will be a, a real to and fro. And um, um, I think until the final whistle blows, we, we won't know who's going to win the title on, uh, on Sunday. Yeah, I think if sort of things were to fall in Ajax's way, hypothetically will be some sort of poetic justice after what happened to them at the end of last season. But I think uh, I think Feyenoord, uh, even though they have a history for sort of being uh, bottlers, I think they, they have all that it takes to sort of beat Heracles in the final game of the season at home, where they've been so strong. And um, Excelsior, who you know, have been brilliant to sort of climb out of trouble and and um, that's and will beat and beat beat uh, Feyenoord and it was sort of embarrassing even as I was watching the Ajax game just to see Hakim Zia, Kenny Tete, the whole bench just laughing and the fans also just finding it humorous and, you know, celebrating it. Especially even Peter Buzz didn't expect it. He said he didn't expect it in his press conference. And he also said that he, he also played sort of a younger team because he didn't expect it. He, he was focused on resting players for Lyon. And even if Ajax were, were, to win, uh, were to win, I think they would ro- rotate somewhat against uh, Willem Toy. And that's also important because at earlier this season, that's, that's a match that Ajax drew. Um, so... Uh, you know, um, er- Erwin van der, Lo- van der Looy on his side will be quite confident about uh, Ajax coming to their home. So I think uh, final will win it in the end, but um, and they'll win it. Uh, they they'll score quite early and uh, they'll be in front and they'll cruise. But I think uh, you know Ajax will just be right there with them, and it'll, in the end it will just be decided by that that point. Yeah, I think um, Spain are definitely still favourites to win the title on Sunday. Um, so Heracles still have European football to play for, but you've got to think that Spain are in the group with the expectation of fans behind them. You know, it's going to stir them on um, to a better performance than they had on Sunday. I think they actually turned up in Excelsior thinking we've won the title. Um, we'll just cruise for this game, we'll win it easily and then we'll head back to the court for celebrations and you know, the fans were set up there, like you know, the trophy was there, it was, like, everything was ready for it and then you know, Excelsior were excellent and they played them off the park. I think this Sunday will be a bit different, they'll be a bit more wary. Um, but it's exciting for the Eredivisie, it's the exact same scenario as last season when the old time Ajax had it wrapped up, you know, they went home against this grass cap and then they blew it somehow um, and PSV ended up winning it. But I just can't see that happening two years in a row. Um, I think Feyenoord would just have a bit too much for Heracles. And I actually think, I agree with Shaka that Ajax might actually rotate this weekend and we're willing to play our no pushovers. And I think they might even snatch a point or at least make, could even win against Ajax on Sunday. Yeah, I'm in disagreement there, Michael. I think um, Willem Toy have been poor for a long time recently. They may raise their game for the visit of Ajax, especially given the circumstances, but there's a, a very much a end of season feel about the club, and a lot of players are, are playing at half the capacity. And I'm not so sure. Um, I think Ajax will rock up and get the early goals, and it will be fairly comfortable for them. But look at Feyenoord. Um, I'm trying not to sound anti-Feyenoord here. I'm really not. But 
Paracas are, are, are going to come to final with the hope of spoiling it. And I've written my predictions that were released on Thursday or Friday um, about Samuel Antilos because he's the second top goal scorer in the league behind only finals Jorgensen. And he has been on form recently. Paracas can't stop winning games because of his form. This, they don't they don't draw many games. It's win or win or bust really for them, um, and I think they'll they'll come very, with a lot of confidence. And Amontillas have, have a point to prove as well as my point because he didn't play very well for Feyenoord when he was on loan there um, a few years ago. He have a point to prove, and he will do it in the cruelest way possible if he can. Um, so yeah, let, let's see. But I I agree with James. It's going to be up and down, um, and it it could well end up like last season where it might be a sweet victory for Ajax after all of that and I think as well my prediction for the whole season has been Ajax will win the title and final will bottle it but it still hasn't happened and it well I mean over the last couple of months the leaders have dropped points but Ajax have too and um, yeah let's see what happens on the final day and even though we keep saying that at home against against a mid-table team final will do the job they've got a fantastic home record and all the fans are behind them. Well, the fans were behind them last weekend, and the expectation will be a lot worse this weekend. Don't forget as well that um, the pressure was obviously on the players uh, last time round. It will be this time round. Yeah, I'm just not so sure. Um, I'm not fully confident in a win, and the team is very workmanlike as well. So you would think of all teams final were put away Excelsior, but they were they were appalling. Gotta be honest, um, Excelsior. Didn't have too many chances, but they, they took them and final really weren't that creative in the end to to deserve a win at all. Yeah, I get what you're saying about our materials. He's sort of in danger and, you know, um, Stegman can play this counter-attacking game, especially with our materials and Kuas. In the attack, our materials can also score from free kicks. But I think this is the type of game that the final would win. Uh, this is the type of game that final would have won throughout the season. Uh, um, you know, I think final can, uh, if, if things did get difficult, final can outlast Heracles. Uh, and, you know, in the back four, you know, Heracles have two players that are going to be leaving at the end of the season. So, I think m maybe their minds will be on that and uh, also just, um, you know, having already been shoo-ins for the, for the Europa League playoffs, they might be looking, they might be looking at that instead of this final game and, and even just the, um, you know, even just incent having your incentives for, uh, anywhere else against final Feyenoord will thrash you and final will beat you, especially with someone like Jorgensen, uh, uh, Jorgensen in the starting lineup. So I think, you know, final players, they've got a bit of experience in the team. You've got your Koitz, you've got your um, Elias, you've got Jorgensen, you've got Bergheis, and I think uh, you've got El, El Amadi, but again, Van der Hayden. And I think after last week's debacle, they're going to sort of grit their teeth at this match and they're going to show up to the decade with in front of their fans playing like they have to win and they're going to retake the game to Heracles and uh, they, they're able to last them they were more quality than, than them and I expect them to win this one and I think with Willem I think it's just a matter of you know if Boz does rotate and you know Willem can you know they can be a frustrating team at times and they, you know, already drew at the Amsterdam Marina, and just having just having a draw at the Amsterdam Marina against the Ajax. I know Buzz hadn't really uh, implemented his tactics yet, but that will give them a lot of confidence going into this game. One um, interesting aspect for Sunday as well is Tony Belhena is out suspended. So that means that Dirk Coyt will probably start, and he's currently on 99 league goals for Feyenoord. Oh, who's going to bet against him scoring the winner on Sunday that wins final of the title and that's his 100th goal? And that's just that. Um, one player I'd also like to point out for like, as, as along with Armenteros, is Philip Niemeyer. Um, the young midfielder's actually been very impressive the last few weeks. He's been given his chance towards the end of the season as 
um, as, as safety was secured. And we're only looking at the table now. And yeah, he's been very good, very good box box midfielder, very threatening in the box as well. He finishes chances very well. Um, and he'll be keen to impress as well on the big stage. Yeah, if we're talking about young players, uh, Heracles, you're going to have to make me mention one of my favourite players in the area, the VC, and a player that I rate incredibly high, 19-year-old Justin Hogma, centre-back, uh, who's played basically every game. The CIES, um, you know, they, they sort of had the statistics where he's one of the teenagers that, that have played the most this season, and he's sort of very tall, lanky, very immaculate at bringing the ball out, very calm in some situations, but he's, he's, he can ref, refine some of um, his play on the board to just take it up to another level, and um, he can he's very capable of get, engaging attackers defensively, defensively, and he just how he handles this game at the end of his, at his breakout season will be very interesting to watch. Now, James, I know I know you wanted to talk about the uh, AWC relegation playoffs. And just heading into the last day, we've got uh, vital fixtures for Loda, Sparta and NEC. Um, NEC need to beat Helen Vane away to have any chance of surviving. You've got Sparta away at Go Ahead Eagles. And again, must win to survive. And Roda away at Vitesse. Um, I just wanted to make a quick point before I let you talk, James. Um, that that Roda, it would would a, a point would be no good for them, and their usual defensive style might not get them out of trouble this time. Because if Sparta or NEC win below them, they'll overtake them. Because goal difference won't help. Um, but yeah, you want to discuss where these teams would fall into the relegation playoffs and who do you think could come up out of those lot? Well, to, to make it easier, make it easier, easier for the listener, if we take the uh, teams where they to finish as they currently are, um, you're looking at um, uh, um, Nijmegen playing Almeida City or Helmand Sport in the, in, the, in, the, in the relegation, in the first uh, relegation playoff. Uh, Helmand Sport won 4-2 against uh, Almeida City on first on, um, on Tuesday, I believe. I, I believe it was. So that was um, no, on Monday. Sorry, and uh, the second leg is on Friday. Uh, you have the first round of the promotion players, and then you have the second round. The ratified fixtures for the second round at the moment are currently MVV Maastricht against Cambu Leeuwarden. And the winner of that tie would go on to play, let's just say for argument's sake, one of Nijmegen or Helmand Sport. And, um, and then they would play against each other and that would be the, the final round. And whoever wins those, um, one of, whoever wins that, that match up over two legs would, uh, would either remain in the Eredivisie or get promoted to the Eredivisie. If you look at the second, uh, the second half of the draw uh, for the... Um, Second round, one ratified fixture already is FC Volendam against uh, NAC Breda. And then you've got uh, the possibility of FC Emmen playing Sparta Rotterdam in the, um, in the other game. Um, and then, uh, what, like following on from the first example, then they would match up and then whoever wins in the final round over two legs would go through. So when the fixtures were ratified, I, um, I tweeted that I believe that We'll, we would be seeing um, at, what, at least one of Almeida City, Cambo Lerard and, and Nac Breda in the EWC next season. I think Nac Breda, they have a fantastic chance. I can see them beating uh, Volendam over two legs and then should they go on to face uh, Sp- um, Sparta, uh, Sparta Lotterdam and uh, I, I can see them winning over two legs, for example. Uh, Hellman Sport had a wonderful result against um, against Almeida City winning 4-2 at home where they... Uh, they were scored four goals in the last 20 minutes, which is extremely impressive. But I think with the second leg being in Almira, I think that will be uh, that will be a big test, and I can see uh, I can see Almira City going on to play Nijmegen, which will be interesting for manager Jack de Gier because he was a, a, he was an, a striker. Uh, the man, he was um, 
the trainer of the strikers at Nijmegen not so long ago, so it'll be interesting for him to go back to his own old stomping ground. It is a little bit of an unorthodox system. System. I hope I've explained it as as, um, as clear as I can. That's why I also sent the, sent you all three of you the uh, the schedule to to have the visual to have the visual as well. Uh, this um, promotion, um, this way of gaining promotion, has been um, has been. Um, something which has been quite regular for a long time which doesn't appear to be changed uh, with the financial difficulties that clubs like uh, Fortuna Sittard and uh, FC Os and Dordrecht have the whole Europa League in general it's not like the championship where they're all geared to eventually eventually playing Premier League football at some point most are geared just for survival and uh, or maybe um um, consolidating and then trying to get up in future years. There's a lot less. Um, there's a lot less um, of a rush to uh, to return as soon as possible, and it's um, it's also in terms of uh, ground stipulations and, and how thorough the Dutch FA is in terms of meeting all the criteria to get promoted. So, uh, although it may be a um, a bit of an unorthodox method of uh, of deciding who gets promoted and who gets relegated in terms of uh, two-legged ties between uh, in different teams in the Europa League and in the VC. It's uh, it's here to stay for the uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, um, I have a lot on Armia City. I hope that they sort of they can uh, make it uh, through the match against Helmand. Um, you know, as, especially with what they've done with Fred Graham, Vincent Janssen. They signed Ajax centre-back um, Damon Morani from the Youth Academy and just having the having the ability to, and the initiative to just pick off, you know, young players that are falling out of the academies and just sort of nurture them and um, it's, it's um, and they deserve to be this far, especially uh, when you talk about the Upilla League and, you know, when you, when you finish, when you, you talk about a season where um, PS, young PSV and young Ajax finished in the top four, so I think it will be a very interesting uh, playoff round, and um, it, it will be interesting when it gets to the nitty gritty when Sparta and NEC, who you know Sparta, you know won one nil against uh, Twente, and just how much fight do these teams have left in them because. It's literally their backs against the wall. It's win or lose, and uh, to you know get into the final. And it will be a very interesting uh, thing for them. And I think Campbell, the with with their manager, forty-two year old Sipka Hoshov, and the strides that they have made this season after um, having a bad start under under Rob Mars, and just having the uh, initiative to, you know, not just uh, to sack one manager, but to sort of uh, introduce a managerial partnership between uh, Hoshoff and Arne Slot. I think they, they all, and they've been trying to sort of break ground with the academy and uh, sort of a different way of coaching and a different way of playing and playing different, many different formations and just having a very tactically adaptable team. And there, there will be some of my picks from the Upilla League um, to sort of come through. And NAC too um, won the Eredivisie a few years ago. And yeah, the another one team, but I'm particularly interested in, in if Sparta and NEC are uh, the how how they are able to sort to sort of be in a manager situation which is more demanding of them as a team. And those characters. But um, surely, if you look at the ODVC, uh, do do you think that Sparta will survive? Because they, if they can, they forget a win against Bottom so go ahead. They are already relegated. They can overtake Roda, and suddenly Roda back in trouble after it looked like they were going to survive for so long. No, I don't think I don't think Sparta will survive. I think um, I think if Sparta came up against Nakbreda over two legs, I don't think they'd win. 
I, I think a shout out too for Cabo Lerard, and they also have a fantastic chance of um, of um, of getting through to the uh, latter stages. I can see them beating uh, Maastricht over two legs. Um, as I stated um, um, previously on the pod, I, I just think that the time for the UPL League clubs is coming, and I think. I think the Sparta and Nijmegen, I think when they're put in high pressure situations, I don't think they'll be able to deal with it. Um, I also wanted to make one another point. Um, it's recently been confirmed that uh, Leon Flemings is uh, the new manager of Go Ahead Eagles. This is a man that hasn't managed for four, for four, for four seasons. Again, I think it's a, a strange appointment. I spoke to Jack De Gier last uh, last October, and it was a very, very interesting interview. And it makes me wonder why Go Ahead would choose to appoint someone who hasn't managed for four seasons when you've got a competent manager in Jack De Gier who has brought Almeida City to the promotion playoffs and they have a chance of playing in the e division next season. And considering the budget they have and considering where they've come from, I think it's, um, it's a great achievement already. And um, I do find it strange how, especially the lower... To middle part of the year, the the the, um, the managerial appointments appear to be getting uh, stranger and stranger, and I don't know if that's got to do with policy. I'm not sure if that's due to uh, technical directors perhaps only looking out for their interest, own interest. But you would hope to make the year the better from middle to to bottom that that they would let the the good managers of the UPL League clubs um, go up to the Eredivisie and prove their worth, and, and then, and then as time goes on, you will get a more rounded and um, a more competitive uh, league. Okay. Um, as a final topic on our podcast this week, um, we must start looking at all the transfer news that's starting to happen, and one of the biggest stories that's coming out of the Netherlands is David Klaassen supposedly being linked with a transfer to Everton to link up with Dutch manager Ronald Koeman. Um, what do we think about that? Do you think he's ready for the Premier League? Do you think that these rumours are true? I actually have a piece coming out on the site uh, that I finished earlier today about class and, and how I think that he's ready for the step up um, and that where I think he needs to improve. And I, I basically just wrote that uh, this season has been in as I've mentioned on this podcast, has he's been mentioned as um, he's mentioned as his best season ever. He doesn't feel any niggles in his knee or groin, and um, he's scored a lot and he's assisted a lot. The just main thing about Carson is like if you just make him the creative outlet of your team, uh, he's not one of those innately creative attacking midfielders like you know Hakim Ziyech or Christian Eriksen. He's, he's there, he really just comes alive in the final third and his ability to just, his, his innate sense of space, uh, passing movement, just there in the final third is what really makes the difference for him as a player. And um, I, I, for Everton fans, I think if they lost Ross, Bar- lost, uh, Ross Barkley and they chose to replace him to, with uh, Klaassen, that would be sort of a bad move. But if you were looking to play Barkley and Carson together, I think that would work more. And um, because, you know, you know where Barkley sort of is lacking with, is with that final output, and that's where Carson's strengths are. And, you know, I think as with a, a few area division players, it would take him, um, uh, it would take him, you know, some time to adapt. But I think, Instead of a whole season, it would just be about one to three games. One to three games. You know, he's leaving at the same time, you know, by now them left, uh, you know, and uh, they've sort of honed their skills in the final third in the same way. And he's also become, he's also grown physically like Van Adam. He sort of handles himself in the physical battles much better. And he started to get involved with play. Uh, more at Ajax as the weeks have gone on and as the season has gone on, but he's still not getting involved enough. And that's w- one place where you would like to see him grow so he can become an all-round sort of midfielder just to 
get involved with passing and all that stuff and build up. And because he's very capable of doing that, he's a very capable passer and he's a very capable mover in between the lines. So I think uh, if Everton were to sign him for, you know, a big fee, 20 million euros or 20 million pounds that's been touted, I think that would be great for all parties involved because Ajax in a place where, you know, they've got a lot of young players that are, that are going to replace them and that money can be invested elsewhere. Yeah, Jack, and I think if you've seen that already, that sort of link up perhaps between Barkley and Klaassen because Hakim Ziyech is a sort of similar player to Barkley with his movement, his shooting and creativity. You have Ziyech and Klaassen sort of swapping between the 10 and the 8 role in midfield and I think a similar thing could happen with Everton there. Perhaps could have seen something there. I think um, Everton's a perfect next step for Klaassen though. I think he's not ready maybe for the upper tier Champions League side at the moment and but you see Dutch players making a mistake, Memphis Depay made a mistake of going straight to my United. Um, you know, David Klassen going to maybe that second tier club, like uh, Everton, like uh, a Leverkusen. No, but that's the right move for his career um, at the moment. Uh, but it's a lot of money for Everton to spend on a player that, if he doesn't fit right and score the goals that he needs to score in that midfield position, it could be, be a mistake, I think. It's interesting that Football International have been speaking with this analyst um, company called Sky Sports, who actually played a big role in Memphis Depay signing for Leon. They actually advised his advisors that Leon play a system that suits Memphis Depay's game, um, and they took that into consideration when deciding on when who he should sign for. And they've actually said that Everton is the ideal club for David Carson and the way they play. Preston style, um, Carson fits straight into that. He also fits right into Napoli style play if Mark Hamzik left. Um, I think that's going to become a bigger thing in football in the future. These analyst websites deciding for clubs, you know, what position they need, what players fit that role. And I think David Carson fits a role in Everton's side. And uh, I think if Everton did sign him, the fans are getting a, a good player there. Ajax have extended the um, the minimum amount of the transfer free to 25 million euros. So it'll be very, very interesting to see how many clubs are prepared to pay that amount for him. Apparently, his uh, agent, uh, Soren Lerby, uh, has stated to Corriere de la Sport that come uh, hook or that Klaassen will be leaving uh, this summer. Uh, there is also apparent interest, as uh, as Mike said, from uh, from Napoli. Also, Spanish side Villarreal also are interested. Um, personally, I'd like to see him try something different. If he was to go to Serie A, maybe fo- maybe follow the lead of um, of Denis Mertens, uh, he will be playing in an extremely strong league, and the same goes for La Liga with Villarreal. Um, I know talk of the Premier League is is uh, is quite apparent and uh, a natural step for most Dutch players when they've had a um, when they've had a, an awful lot of experience with their respective clubs. But I think it would be wise to maybe go to Spain or Italy first and then should he make an impact in, in La Liga or Serie A, then he could uh, go on to the Premier League with all the experiences he would have built up. Uh, you could also call on the experience of uh, Depay's decision to go to Manchester United. He's now found himself at um, at Lyon. Uh, there are also uh, other examples of players that have gone far too early or made the wrong choice somewhere along the line. So I would advocate for Klaassen to choose if the uh, opportunity was there, one of Napoli or Villarreal. Um, just as a side topic, I'd like to... Just mentioned everyone's under 17 team um, currently in the under 17 European Championships in Croatia. They just made the quarterfinals today and um, they lost 3 0 to England after going a man down and um, finished second in the group. And they'll play Germany on Saturday. If they win that game against Germany, which is highly unlikely by the way they're playing, um, they actually make the under 17 World Cup, which is played in India next year. Um, it's a tough task for Netherlands because. Coach decided not to take many Ajax players 
with the squad. Um, Ray Dan is the man who got them to the championships with all his goals. He was um, left out of the squad. And the biggest talent in the squad that went was uh, Myron Badu, the AZ youngster. But he's actually fallen out for injury as well. Um, and watching them, I've watched all three of the games so far. It's not the most talented squad that it could be. Um, I can't see them being Germany on Saturday. And then that, that means they're in a playoff to try and reach the M17 World Cup.